Hello everyone and welcome to church. I'm Chris and I'm your online campus pastor. How firm are you on your boundaries? I was in a small group recently where we talked about the boundaries surrounding us growing up. Some of our parents had very clear boundaries and some of us had boundaries that changed all the time depending on the mood of each parent. While not all of the clear boundaries were necessarily good boundaries, they provided some consistency. The way we parent, lead, or teach of often is different than how we lead our own lives, though. I have clear boundaries as a father, but as a friend or as a coworker, well, that's harder. Today, we're going to talk about that. How can we let our yes simply be yes and our no be no? This is our last week in our sermon series called Guardrails, and I am so glad that you're here. I have really gotten a lot out of this series, and I hope that you have too. If nothing else, I hope you've been able to learn that good guardrails matter, and they make our relationships better, and our own lives healthier. And just a reminder that if you want to learn more about this stuff, you can check out the book called Boundaries by Dr. Cloud and Townsend. But we still have one great message today, so stick around as we get into that. Before we do any of that though, we will first worship together. And during worship, I want you to take this time to evaluate where your heart is right now. Are you present in the moment or are you already checking out and contemplating what's gonna happen after church? And listen, no judgment, I do that too. But figure out where your heart is and ask God to help you be present. Let's worship.
Thank you for the music worship team and thank you to you for being here to worship God with us. Now we will continue worship by giving. And I have just one thing to say about giving today. Giving is hard. I just moved and started a new job and so I had to go through my finances again. And let me be real with you. It is painful to put 10% of my money towards something that doesn't gain me interest and doesn't let me have fun, right? Maybe you can relate. When it comes down to it, it is so hard to tithe in this world because every cent matters, right? But, and hear me out, that is why giving is so important. It is the situation where we put our cards on the table and we really test our faith in God to provide for us. And here's the thing, tithing isn't a rule kept by an angry father. It's a gift to us to make us better people and more like Jesus. God doesn't love tithers more than non-tithers, but he wants us to give because it's so good for us to be generous. Now, if you would like to give, you can do so by clicking the link in the chat or by going to our website, astera.church, and clicking the button at the top of the page that says give. With that, let's join together for our last sermon series in this series called Guardrails. Good morning, online church. Welcome to Estero Church this morning. Uh, we are glad to have you as we are cranking into September here. Hey, we are finishing our series today called Guardrails, where we're talking about boundaries, how to keep from kind of running off the road and how to keep yourself in good place and in good shape. Uh, we've talked about having permeable boundaries, how to let the bad stuff out and how to let the good stuff in. And we've talked about uh, boundaries really are about what you say yes to and what you say no to. And sometimes because we live in a fallen world, we say yes to things we shouldn't. And sometimes we say no to things that in fact we should be saying yes to. And that part of our growth, part of the maturing process is figuring out uh, our boundaries. I want to start today with a story from Scripture that's really enlightening as far as boundaries and guardrails go. Um, and you may not, when you hear the story, think, wait a minute, is this really about boundaries? So I want you to hang in with me for a second. You probably know the story if you've been around the church at all, uh, but maybe you haven't thought of it this way before. It's the story of Jesus' encounter with a rich young ruler from Mark 10. Let me read you the passage. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. 
One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. What's interesting here is how this interaction played out. This man comes and asks, um, listen, what do I have to do to get to heaven? It's a great question. It's an important question. Jesus tells him, hey, listen, you have to be obedient to the commandments. You have to follow the commandments. And the guy says, listen, since I was a boy, since I came of age would be what was kind of uh, implied there. Since I came to that age of responsibility, I've done that. And then there's this really interesting verse where it says Jesus looked at him and loved him. Now, let me ask you, why do you think if the Holy Spirit inspired the scripture to be written as the very word of God, living and active to teach us and train us in all the things of God. Why do you think that the Holy Spirit would include that detail, that Jesus looked at him and loved him? Jesus loved this guy. In fact, he loved him enough to, in his normal, let's get to the heart of the matter kind of way, which Jesus does all the time, he actually calls him out on his idolatry with money. But he doesn't call him out by condemning him as a sinner. He doesn't say, hey, listen, you have an issue with money that you need to deal with. He calls him out by asking him to surrender. Go sell everything you have. That is then coupled with the invitation then to come follow me. He was inviting this guy to come and be one of his disciples. He was inviting him to come and follow him, to join him in this ministry, which, by the way, would lead him to the eternal life that he was seeking. And here's where it gets really interesting. Because in response to Jesus' challenge to sell everything he has and give the money to the poor and then come follow him, this guy's face fell. You know what that means? It means he went, oh. And he went away sad because he couldn't conceive that the answer to the question about what he had to do to get eternal life would involve God asking him to give up his wealth. Now, you say, what does this have to do with guardrails? Well, here's what's so interesting. What does Jesus do in response to the man's, no, I can't do that? What does Jesus do? The answer is nothing. Even though he loved him, and even though he knew it would be better for him to say yes to his offer, to come and follow him, to be free of this idolatry of money, even though he knew all of that, Jesus let him walk away. He respected his no. And there's a powerful principle there for us. God will respect our yes, and God will respect our no. Even if we say yes to the wrong things, and no to the right things, and even if it means us harm, God will respect your yes, and God will respect your no. 
Think of the parable of the prodigal son who demanded that he be given his inheritance before his father had even passed, which particularly in that culture would have been a huge sign of disrespect and contempt for your father. Who then left the family and his responsibilities in the family business, who squandered his wealth in sinful living. The father respected his yes to his to doing that and his no to the good things he would have had had he stayed with the family where he belonged. Or how about in John 6, we have this extended discourse with Jesus and his disciples about him being the bread of life. We like that concept. We love to call Jesus the bread of life. But if you look at the whole context of that conversation, it's really interesting because he's comparing himself to the manna. And at one point he says to them, that unless they ate his flesh and drank his blood, they wouldn't be able to have eternal life. Think of how crazy that sounds. Now, we can make sense of that because we know the whole story. We know, listen, he's making reference to the cross, to the resurrection, to communion. But they didn't know that. They didn't get that. They didn't have that. They couldn't look back and see how it made sense. It's also important to get the context that this conversation came up because these disciples were demanding a sign from him to authenticate who he was. In other words, what are you going to do? What miraculous thing are you going to do to show us that you're, in fact, the Messiah? He was telling them the sign they would get which was the cross, the resurrection, the Holy Spirit, and communion. So he was actually answering their question. But he was doing it not in a plain spoken way, but in a way that actually kept it hidden from them, that required their faith to trust that what he was saying would somehow make sense, even when it didn't make sense. In other words, he spoke to them in a layered way where his meaning was, wasn't obvious at all. In fact, it was kind of, it was a negative thing. It said that a whole bunch of people struggled with the whole, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood thing, as you can well imagine. I mean, imagine a preacher coming and saying, listen, you want to get to heaven? You got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And many people who were following Jesus deserted him at that point. They said, it's too much. You've gone too far. I, I can't do this. Which I'm sure seemed reasonable to them. But here's the thing. He let them go. God will respect your yes and your no. He won't violate them. Nor will he always save you from the consequences of them, even if the consequences are ultimately bad, which is another way to say what we said in Galatians a few weeks ago. God is not mocked. You reap what you sow. All of that to say that if it's true that God will respect your yes and your no, you have to be deliberate and thoughtful and careful in how you answer him, in how you answer God's call to your life. He'll respect your yes. He'll respect your no. But you have to be thoughtful and deliberate and careful in what you say yes and no to. So I want to spend the last little bit of this series, and man, I feel like we could go on with this series for a couple more months, but I want to spend the last part of this series talking about how relationships are two-way streets. And as you set 
guardrails, as you set boundaries, even healthy ones, other people are going to respond. Sometimes they're going to respond well. Sometimes they're not going to respond so well. And as you do this, it's going to change the dynamic of your relationships because it's going to change the dynamic of how you all interact with each other. Your yes, your no, as you clarify what's your yard and what isn't in those relationships, you're not guaranteed that it's going to be good in the way that it changes things. You're not guaranteed that it's going to be easy. Other people may not respond well to that. Now, that's not a reason to not do it. But it can make it uncomfortable. But again, because it's uncomfortable doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. In the book, they talk about some myths of keeping good boundaries. One of those myths is if I set boundaries, I'm being selfish and I'm making everything about me. And after all, doesn't the Bible tell us to be loving and to care about others above ourselves? The answer is yes, the Bible does say that. But here again, we need the whole counsel of Scripture here. I want you to think of it this way. Is it selfish for a pro athlete to keep themselves in top physical condition? I mean, after all, the best chance they have of producing the kinds of results they want on whatever field they're competing on is if they are doing the things they need to do to keep their bodies ready to perform to the best of their abilities, right? Would it be loving or would it be completely unloving to take me and put me in a pro football game, even for one play? I'm not prepared or even capable at this point of competing at that level. I probably never was capable. Now, it's possible, although hugely unlikely, that with a great deal of training a la Rocky Balboa training sequence from his movies, I might be able to raise myself to the level where I could last one play without hospitalization. But my goal would be to survive, not thrive. And I would still stink. The point is that without proper preparation in the areas of exercise, nutrition, specific skill work, all of those things, I wouldn't have a chance. So think of it this way. What training is to athletes, healthy boundaries are to hearts and souls. Without dedicated work in the area of healthy boundaries, I wouldn't have a chance to be able to love someone else well. I would be unprepared to do it and do it well. So is it selfish? No. Now, that kind of leads us to we have to look for a definition of what loving someone else actually is. For example, is it loving to not do an intervention with a drug addict in your family because you know it's going to make you uncomfortable and them unhappy to be confronted even though their life is out of control? Is it loving to walk around on eggshells all the time in an attempt to keep your significant other from another one of their periodic explosive anger incidents that is going to come eventually no matter what you do? Is it loving to hover over every area of your child's life and never allow them to learn through struggle or being uncomfortable because you never want them to be unhappy? or you never want yourself to look bad as a parent? Is it loving to deplete yourself to the point where all you have is resentment towards those you should love because all you do is give in to the needs of others? 
You won't be able to pull off loving without healthy boundaries. So is having healthy boundaries selfish? The answer is no. But even then, it's not that clear cut. Why? Because we're complicated. And the motivation behind our boundaries needs to be regularly examined with ourselves, with God, and with other people. The book says boundaries are a litmus test for the quality of our relationships. I really like that. They're a litmus test for the quality of our relationships. Those people in our lives who can respect our boundaries will love our wills, our opinions, our separateness. Those who can't respect our boundaries are telling us they don't love our no. They only love our yes, our compliance. Let me ask you, if someone only loves you when you say yes to them, is that really love? And are you being loving by entering into that kind of a relationship? Setting healthy boundaries is the heart and soul work that we need to do to be able to be loving. So let me end where I began. This idea of building healthy guardrails, keeping healthy boundaries, it's about what you say yes to in your life and what you say no to. It's about what you allow in your yard. It's often complicated and it's messy work because we live in a fallen and broken world and we are fallen and broken people who have sometimes significant character flaws. And yet the work of learning to take care of your own yard knowing where you end and someone else begins, of not allowing others to dump their trash on your property, to stop dumping your trash onto other people's property, to train our kids to own their yeses and their noes, and parents understanding that those, that changes as they get older. You may not accept their no at four, but you may need to talk it through with them at 14, and you may need to un uh, just accept it without question at 24. All of that makes me think um, about, I've had a few times where I've done weddings where I've had to fire the parents and just say, listen, you're not involved in this anymore because they were so kind of enmeshed, the boundaries were so unclear as this couple was starting to, uh, to create their own life. And that's a breaking, a boundary point, right? I've had to fire parents. The Holy Spirit, other people, will help you do this important soul work. You have to lean into those. You have to move slowly. You have to renew your mind with scripture and say, is this? You have to look for patterns. You have to, eh, as uncomfortable as it is, sometimes you have to do some self-examination and some growth. But God will lead you to make progress. The healthier you are, the healthier you are, the more loving you'll be, the more fruitful you'll be. The healthier you are, the more loving you'll be, the more fruitful you'll be. All of that from let your yes be yes and your no be no. Let's pray. Well, Jesus, thank you that, um, first of all, you respect our boundaries. Thank you that um, you allow us this ability to say yes and no. I pray, uh, Father, for every one of us 
that we would get better and stronger and healthier and more loving by having healthier boundaries. Show us where we need to clean up our yard. Show us where we need to set our fences. Show us things that we've said yes to that we should now say no to and things we've said no to that we need to say yes to. Help us to figure out our habits, our priorities, and Lord, help us to say yes to you. Move in us. Do your work, Lord. Uh, we ha I have to admit, some of this stuff is so complicated and so deep in me, I can't figure it out. I just need you to show me. I need to see it in your word or hear it from your people and trust you. And so, Lord, I'm asking you to do that for each of us. As we lean into this work, of being able to be more fruitful. I want to pray for every parent who watches this, everyone, that you would give them wisdom as they help to raise their children. That you would, Lord, in those important moments, just prompt them with wisdom to know how to respond, what to do, to be able to be examples in significant ways pray for kids that you would help them to grow up and to be able to set healthy boundaries that you would protect them through them and Lord I pray for our church that our church would be a place also that just practices healthy boundaries with each other with our community and with the world so continue to do your work in us we pray in Jesus name amen Hey, so thankful that you're with us again this week. I really hope this series has been helpful for you. Really want you to kind of continue to do this work. This is the work of discipleship. It really is. So lean in, see where the Lord leads you. And even if it doesn't make sense, trust him. Have a great week. Thank you for the message, Pastor Tim. So church, is your yes, yes? Is your no, no? And is this something you need to work on? Consider the fact that when you have good, strong boundaries, when you have good, strong guardrails in your life, your life will be healthier and your relationships will be better. Now, receive the benediction. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Thanks for being with us. Have a wonderful week.